everybody. Yeah, she'll probably have waited to get the mic. Yeah, come on out, guys. Uh, so my name is Franklin Leonard. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of something called The Blacklist, um, which is a company that exists to identify and celebrate great screenwriting. I won't belabor that right now. Check out our website, blacklist.novowels.com, B-L-C-K-L-S-T. Um, or read this month's Atlantic Monthly. There's an article about uh, the work that we do. Um, but more importantly, we are here today to discuss uh, depicting reality on screen. And SAG AFTRA Foundation has put together a hell of a panel for you guys this evening. So if you guys could give them a warm welcome, and then I'm going to have them introduce themselves. <laughs> that was pathetic. <laughs> I'm just going to give it to you straight. That was awful. Um, this is being live streamed. There are a ton of people at home, many of whom couldn't get in because you guys are actually here in the seats. Let's do a little bit of a better job to make them jealous of the fact that they're not here by applauding as though this room was just crazy and raucous. Thank you. That is much better. I also didn't take into account that this is probably a lot of actors and therefore they would really go for it. Um, <laughs> all right, so let me, let's just start by having you guys introduce yourselves and sort of the film that you made that, that sort of, you know, got you on this panel about depicting life on screen. Uh, hi guys, my name is Andrew Ron. I'm the writer-director of a film called Spa Night, uh, which premiered at Sundance last year in 2016. Um, uh, won a, a special jury prize for a breakthrough performance for my actor, Josa, who is a sag after member. Um, and um, the, the film is about a Korean-American immigrant family living in Los Angeles. And uh, the young man in the family, um, David, uh, David Cho, he takes a job at a Korean spa um, to help his family um, make ends meet. And while he's at the spa, he finds out that it's a popular space for gay men to hook up. Hi guys, I'm Drake Doremus. Um, I guess the film that I'm most known for at this point is a film called Like Crazy that I made in 2011. It won the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance, uh, and then Paramount put it out that following October, and um, just been making films and doing stuff. I think I made seven, so uh, continuing to do it. Testing. Um, <laughs> Hey, I'm Justin Tipping. I uh, directed and wrote a film called Kicks. It was uh, picked up by Focus and it had its premiere at Tribeca this two past 16. Um, oh, right. Yeah, it's about a kid who gets jump for his brand new pair of J's. And it's kind of a teenage odyssey of him trying to get him back. Uh, I got jumped from my Nikes when I was 16, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> I was gonna say, for those who don't know, J's are sneakers. My name is Elizabeth Wood. I made a film called White Girl. It was at Sundance 2016 with Spa Night. It's um, about a white girl and about cocaine. And it was inspired by my sophomore year of college. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with, with, with this question. Obviously, it's 2017. Um, the world's a little crazy right now. Um, Y'all can draw whatever conclusion you want from my, that statement. Um, but why, and obviously you all made your films before we find ourselves in the current situation, but why write a story about your own experience? Like, why should anybody care fundamentally? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, sorry. I, 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 I'll, I'll ask the question slightly differently. Okay, I was going to answer that one. Okay. All right, well, then, well, then, 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 then let's <laughs> go ahead. it, never mind. No, 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 I was going to say, I mean, look, it, it, you know, the film is a, is a sort of singular art form in that it requires an inordinate amount of capital to mount. Um, there are certainly more commercial stories than the ones that you guys chose to tell. A and there are arguably stories that, uh, that, that, that quote, unquote, matter more. Like, you know, you could have done a movie about, you know, refugees from Yemen. But you chose to tell a story about your own lives. Why, and, and, and why, why was it so important for you to tell the story that you told? Okay, I'll, I'll still answer. Great. Um, I know it's, it's incredibly hard to get your first film made, and it was so useful for me that what I was trying to make is something I knew really well. You know, I hadn't 
made a feature film. I hadn't worked with actors in this capacity. No one had ever invested that much money in me. The fact I could go into meetings and this was my life, um, I knew it, no one else could tell this story, made people listen. Um, there was not gonna be another story like it on their desk. Um, I also think making a film is just so hard, despite the fact it's hard to get it made, it's just so hard that uh, being extremely passionate helps get you over the hump of, of sleeplessness and having to make sacrifices and having to lose money and all kinds of things. And so if you care a lot because it's your life, you're going to probably stick with it long enough to get it made. I mean, I don't know how long it took you guys to get your film made, but from the time I started talking about it to the time it premiered was seven years. So if I didn't fucking care, why would I keep talking about it for seven years? Me too. <laughs> like literally seven I mean, years. I guess the uh, one answer too is that it's, I mean, there's so much bullshit out there. There's so many bullshit movies, so many bullshit performances. No. It's just, it, 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 anytime something's honest and feels honest and people know it's honest, it stands out. And it's important that people continue to make those movies because there just aren't enough of them. I think it's really important. Yeah, that is applause worthy. I agree. I think, I think it's really important that, um, that films uh, have, have, nuanced um, portrayals of, of people, you know, because it, it, I think it's through nuance that you gain a sense of humanity and, and, and uh, people can feel like members of our community and not like people you can kind of shove off as, as an other. And so for me, you know, um, I have the most insight into the nuance of my own life, you know, than I do anybody else. And so um, it, it is a little bit of a, a shortcut where it's like, okay, I can I can write about my experience. Um, and obviously I'd love to make films that aren't exactly my gay Korean American experience, um, but it would take a certain amount of like wanting to do research and, and like really um, learning about, uh, you know, another community or, or um, other people, and so uh, I think with first with first features, like Elizabeth said, like there's this kind of um, knowledge that you know you you can tell your story, you know that you have a, a confidence that you're not going to have in any other in in any other um, uh, capacity. All right, fine, you convinced me. Um, so I, I, I read uh, there's a, there's a profile of Kenny Lonergan in, in this week's New Yorker, and, and there's a, a quote of his that I thought that sort of struck me in the context of, of, of this conversation, which was that everybody's life is an opera, even if they're just paying bills. And I'm curious, given the fact that you you all sort of sort of use your own lives as a point of departure, how do you decide what part of your life is the opera? Like, how do you decide what part, what, what story you want to tell from amongst, from within, like, all the stories of your that's, life? That's easy. Just whatever part hurts the most. That's, that's the one. Whatever is the most, kind of the most painful, really, at the end of the day. I mean, that's the, the hardest thing to make is the thing you should be making. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that was definitely true of yours. I'm, I'm guessing that was also true of yours. I'm almost certain that's true of yours, Elizabeth. And then you got your ass kicked for your shoes. So yours was physically painful, at least, if nothing else. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's the same thing going back. You know, my journey to find the story was was one that was, I started asking myself those questions. And, you know, the first time you said I love you, the first time I said I hate you, those that kind of find your theme, finding your story. Um, maybe AFI, <laughs> that, but, um, but I went back to that. I kept going back to this one point in my life that I, I found humiliating. And when I sit down and try to find and like push characters forward in writing, if you get lost or you're stuck in a certain situation, you just, sometimes you just think to yourself, what if you just humiliate them like completely? And what is their reaction to that? And I kept going back to that and like reliving this moment. And for me, it was like, it wasn't about shoes. It wasn't about getting beat up. It was everything that fell from that. It was going home with bloody eyes and a broken face and looking at my older brother and him looking me in the eyes and saying, it's all good, you're a man now. And it was like heartbreaking when I look back because I completely d disagree in retrospect. So for me, it was like, let me go explore that. Why is violence synonymous with masculinity? And it was, it was specific to a place in the Bay Area where I grew up in a culture that I knew. So like they're all saying like, I didn't have to do any research. It was just what, what's the heart, what's the theme and how can I serve the story? And, and I guess it's also kind of like, you know, tell your story first and then you can go off and tell others, I think is a truism that I heard once from someone smarter than me. 
That's good. I'd never heard that. That makes me feel better. Oh, good. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm curious that once, you, once you've identified this moment, like, what was the worst moment of my life? I'm going to use that as fodder for a movie. How do you go about writing that? Like, mining your own personal experience to tell a story, like, in a very general sense. You know, I'll say, like, there's something about um, identifying and then writing that, for me, feels like one gesture, where the reason I've identified it is because my mind can't stop processing it, you know? That, like, I keep living this moment over and over again, or I keep um, trying to figure out, like, what was it that actually happened there that then kind of propels me into the writing phase. And, and a lot of it is actually this idea of like, what should I have done or what could I have done or what could have happened that would have made this worse, you know? It's this paranoia yeah. um, and this idea that, you know, there were so many other ways I could have gone. Um, and, and there's something about that process that, um, I just do naturally as kind of like a human being, like driving after, you know, a do, conversation. Do you mean you're like processing your, the events in just into sort of film story terms? Like this happened, how can I reconceptualize this in a three act structure? Or, or actually like, I think a step back from that, it's, it's more, um, it's the, it's the brainstorming for what you, you later will then start to kind of, put into something that feels like a film, you know? But it's just this idea of, um, like, what are the, what were the other outcomes that, that would have made this better or would have made this worse that um, gives me the, the kind of distance and then also the material to kind of, you know, start crafting this into a film that's not exactly who I am. Take the root information, develop a whole bunch of other information and then sit down. I mean, do you guys feel the same? Like in terms of your process of how do we massage real life into a story? Like how did you go from, okay, this is the story I want to tell to I'm going to write this script in this form? I got, I started crying, <laughs> uh, got terrified, went to a cafe. No, um, <laughs> Tears streaming you. down yeah. as you type on the laptop. Um, exactly. Took a long walk. Um, but I think that once I knew, okay, here, here's this moment in my life, here's this, this inspiration, and the emotional impetus is there, how do I put structure to it? I think um, I first went, went asked my, started asking myself, when it goes to black, what do, I, what do I want the audience to leave with? What do I want them to, how do I want them to feel, and, and what, what, do, what, what do I want them to take away from it? And so that's a hard question to answer, and I don't think I answered it while writing. I just started writing, um, and then the themes and kind of start present revealing themselves. I think they're like, oh well, you know, if my character wants this in the beginning, but he really needs this, you know, he really he he wants to be respected, but really needs it. What he really needs at the end is to understand that he's always he just needs self confidence and self love. Then I'm like, okay, then I can put him at the beginning of the film with the opposite of that and give him the most damage that's working against that so I can have an, a true arc. So I think that's how I, I kind of want an approach to my younger teenage self being jumped. I, I think it's a really hard task. And I have a lot of friends that are trying to write their first film. I think especially if it's something based on your own life, it's probably something pretty juicy or something really crazy that happened. Um, and I had a professor at film school that said, just because it was like exciting in your life doesn't mean it's gonna make a good movie, right? And that's the challenge. Because it may not have the fairly traditional structure of a film. It may not fit in 90 minutes or four hours or even a TV show. So I think um, there's several factors. One, I think you'll discover what it's about by simply writing it all out. My first draft of White Girl was like 200 pages. Oh. My shooting draft was maybe 70 something. And it was in writing everything, every character, every possible event, it ended with World Trade Center. And if you see the movie, World Trade Center has very, very little to do with it. Um, and like, why am I writing all this stuff down? And then editing, 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 
<clears throat> until all that's left on paper is what I absolutely needed to tell the story. And I knew that with the story of excess, less would be more. And that also, it, with it being my first film, I needed to really focus on a very specific story. And then there's the question of the pure terror of revealing yourself, if it's some very personal, hard to tell story, on the page, what are your friends gonna think? What is your family gonna think? Maybe they don't know, all know this story. Um, my parents had surely never heard this story, and uh, <laughs> to, they I kept me like, it's about a friend. And at the premiere at Sunday at you know, Q&A, I'm still like, it's about a friend. Someone's like, start talking. Uh, still, sorry mom, dad. It's, it's hard, but I found that the more I worked on it, the more I wrote, the more it became fictionalized, because again, what happens in real life isn't a movie, it's a story and you're making a movie out of it, it became further from the truth and it got easier to share and each time I got someone's feedback and talked about it, I, you learn how you're gonna talk about it. And um, yeah, for, again and again, friends come to me, say, how do I do it? Like, without offending uh, my family is usually the concern. And someone once told me that, it, and you said this too, that if it's embarrassing, if it hurts, if you're ashamed of it, if it feels like something you could never tell anyone else, if it's disgusting and raw, you're probably really onto something and other people are gonna connect with you, right? Those are real human moments and no one cares as much as you do. So put it all out there, just write it all out, be so embarrassed and then edit it. Writing is an editing. It's a painful experience, also amazingly therapeutic and uh, you can do it. I'm, I'm curious, just very quickly, like on a scale of zero to 100, what percentage of each of your movies would you say is based on like fact-based stuff that happened to you and how much was fictionalized? Uh, so I, with Spawn, I, I'm going to answer your question by not giving you a number, but by saying that the film feels like 100% emotionally autobiographical. It's truthy. It's but true. Not yeah, truth. Uh, the, like the kind of alternative facts. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> um, but yeah, that that um, that uh, what the character is thinking and processing and and um, feeling about his family and his identity, like those feel really true to me, even if the the events are are different. Um, I'd say 100% in a way, um, just because all my films are about relationships, so it's kind of like a running diary of where I'm at in my life, what I have to say about it, uh, almost, so they're all kind of really personal. It's like, if I don't have something to say, I shouldn't be making a movie, so I feel like, so, uh, like I've made a couple of movies where I was like, I don't know what I had to say, and I'm like, why did I fucking make that? And other movies, I'm like, I really had something to say, and I'm really proud of those films, so it's like, I feel like when I realize I need to make a film, it's because I have something to say, and... And then in the process, I'm always thinking about what do I have to say and what do I have to mean. So that's, uh, I think, 100% usually, you know. It's um, a tough question. Uh, I, well, no, it's not, I guess. I'd probably, probably be like fifth, fifth split down the middle, probably. Um, I rapped in closets, drank 40s in parks. I did stuff like that. I don't know if anyone's seen the movie, but I got my shoes jumped, right? But... Uh, my story ended after I got my shoes jumped. I didn't go after the guy, the kids that took that jumped me. Um, otherwise, it would have been a short film, and I wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> so it's not too late. You could still go after them. <laughs> yeah. Still, yeah, you could. It's, it's a whole different movie, but yeah. potentially a very interesting. It kicks one. two, still kicking. Um, I grow. I grow up. No, but there's there's definitely, um, you know points in the film that resonate with my like other relationships with my family and life that's not explicit but it is it is the tenor of it's the note behind the note of you know like I, I know what that feels like not to be able to go back to grandma's house for some reason you know it's like it's not exactly word for word what you know what my experience was but the 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 spirit of of what I've been through is definitely in there I have no idea because I can't remember anymore what's real life and what's fiction, but um, my best friend from college, who the roommate's character is based on, recently saw it and she said, like, wow, 85% true. There you go. She said, you just didn't have an internship. <laughs> 
Um, I'm curious, I mean, Elizabeth, you mentioned editing as a significant part of the process, like sort of laying it all out. And I think that even if you don't lay it all out on the page, again, like you're sort of taking real life, which is messy and cyclical and non-linear and trying to sort of hew it into a linear story. I'm curious if you guys could talk about how you choose the moments that to keep and how you choose the moments to lose. And is it is it all just in service of the story, or is it also like there's some parts of your life and some whether they're the emotional truths or the actual sort of events that you feel like you really do need to get on the page, you know, sort of movie making be damned. Like, is there ever that moment where you're like, this this is I've got to try to keep this in as much as possible? No because that's so self-indulgent, right? Like, this is so important to me that I'm gonna make someone else suffer. That's a moment where I feel like I'm in jail watching a movie, because it's like, I have to sit through this like masturbatory fantasy of someone else's life. I don't give a fuck, I'm bored. So when I'm editing, if I wanna look at my phone the 30th time I've seen a scene, then I need to cut it. Um, and my estimation is mov a movie is made to entertain. Um, and there's so many ways to be entertained these days that I believe it's harder to keep people's energy and I will, I will play to that, I will not play against it. So with me, less is more. Once you get the point, get out of there. And also, I've discovered if something is so complicated, either in writing or in shooting or in editing it, that you go over and over and over it, and you try one thing and it doesn't work, and another, and everyone's arguing, and it's just not making sense, it's, I've never ended up needing it. It didn't make sense. And so that's kind of a good feeling. For me, the easiest answer is usually the best possible answer. And if anything is too complicated, it is too complicated. Drop it. Simplify. Something that I, I found in, in the process of writing and then um, in casting and then in the editing is that the further I could fling my script away from me, the more I could see what was working and what wasn't. Um, and so what exactly do you mean by that? So like if it wasn't just like me in a room like reading it and writing it by myself like if, if it wasn't just me doing it by my on my own um, uh, and I could see someone else like work with it it would give me a perspective so like we did um, like we did table reads of the spa night script and just hearing someone else say the words you know where in my head I was like oh like this this works this could be interesting where it's like as soon as I think of this character as another human being and not me um, I'd be like oh like that doesn't make sense for him like that's that's silly and then in the casting process like that was huge for me too like where I started meeting these actors and and they would have an interpretation or an insight into the character that like I didn't write in, but they found, and I found even more compelling than what I had imagined. Like that was like, those were gifts to me and I tried to find them at every juncture because I felt like that would help me um, have distance. It would, it, would, it would make it exciting, you know? Cause I think if, if I had planned, if the movie that I saw at Sundance was exactly what I had in my head, I'm pretty sure I would fall asleep, you know? <laughs> And it's the it's the surprises that are that are really um, that that I think directors and filmmakers should should relish. Yeah, how, how do the rest of you handle? I mean, you're all writer directors, and you obviously wrote this story inspired by your own lives. Um, how do you handle, you know, the, the contributions of probably mainly actors, but that either you are really excited about and want to incorporate sort of their interpretation, or where you're like not only is that not what actually happened, I don't like it. Like, how do you handle that tension? Because again, I think you probably have a more emotional connection to the story because it's your own, as opposed to something that was fictionalized. H how do you manage that? I imagine the actors here will want to know that as well. Well, for me, anyway, I, um, I'm, I was dealing with a lot of teenagers, um, so, <laughs> Right? <laughs> Teenagers, am I right? Like, um, but so I, I knew like in writing the script that um, the dialogue was what it was, but I knew that I was going to go find actors that were going to bring their own voice to it because I always find that that age and that 
that age is so hard to just be like, no, go line for line. And it's like, no, we we were all, everyone was going to, you know, be speaking slang. And it was like the scripty went crazy by day two. She was like, no, you hit the blunt. And then you say, you know, <laughs> fuck you. And I was like, look, it's not going to be that kind of movie. Like, they're just going to talk like kids. Talk. Like, let's just let them talk. Um, he can hit the blunt whenever he wants. Yeah, he can blunt, hit the blunt whenever he wants. It's fine. Um, but I think it's the, it's probably I think probably story to story and and what is ever serving the story. So in my situation, it, I was definitely it was a collaborative process to get the to kids to be as natural as they could. And I was casting, you know, a lot of kids from after school programs and, and mixing them with actors. Um, so it, it, it for me it was, but I always. I don't know if I could think of it in any other way than, you know, hearing it over and over. Um, Usually that's when it comes more natural. Uh, Yeah, I mean, a lot of my movies are improvised, um, so we work from outlines. Yeah, I was going to say, you you have uh, a very Yeah, we don't really work with a script, so for me, it's all about the actors and collaborating and finding... Finding. I mean, I don't even really audition actors. I just like to spend the day with them and really understand who they are and what's in them and understand what's in me, and then we can push each other and do something together. So I've been really lucky with some of the actors I've been able to work with. But for me, it's like if an idea is not working, it's not working, and you got to have a relationship where you can just be honest about it because you don't want to waste time. But uh, with the improvisation, a lot of it ends up on the floor, and a lot of it ends up not being good. So it's a constant process and evolution to trying to find something that works. And sometimes you have to revisit the scene the next day, right? You know, we reshoot scenes all the time, so it's you know just a constant. Evolution. Evolution, but is there a different experience of working with actors who ostensibly are you on the screen like as opposed to the other actors who are not you like like is it different working with Joe Andrew than it was the other actors oh. I mean, for all for all of you I mean it, it, I imagine it's a little because your process is a little bit different Drake like in terms of the improvisational thing and like we're all gonna get together and figure it out but the rest of you I feel like you had a framework this is who this character is that character is me and I'm now going to direct you is the, is the relationship with the actor who is you on screen different than it is with other folks. And if so, how, you know, I was going to say like, no, it's not. And then I'm like, Oh wait, no, it is like, um, (laughs) and, and I realized like, uh, I had, I had dinner with my lead actor, Joe, um, a couple months after Sundance and we were just chatting and, and he had met my parents, you know, like through the whole, filming process and he told me that like he actually um like learned something about the character after having met my parents and that was like scary to me <laughs> Wait, what, I, did, what did he learn i don't know but like he <laughs> learned something you know I, I i think i think for him it was this idea of um like in the film the the pressure that this character feels to like succeed is 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 not from his parents being assholes to him but the fact that they love him, you know, and that he doesn't want to let them down, and um, and and so there's something about that relationship. I'll say, like, I think I tried to treat him like any other actor, but I I think he was, you know, enterprising enough to to realize that like he was going to try and get to know me and the people around me to to try and mine stuff, you know, and and you know that's a little sneaky, and but I, I think it it helped and it really worked. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it would be inevitable as an actor, like, you have the subject in front of you. Yeah. I'm curious about the rest of you guys. Did you guys notice a different dynamic with well, um, the alt you? From the very beginning of casting, I said it's very important to me that this become your journey, your character's journey. Sure, it was inspired by my life, but I don't think it's healthy for any of us to think that way because it is now fiction. Um, that being said, my lead character, Morgan Saylor, who's a dream, uh, she had, I think, a very difficult role. So the relationship yeah, perhaps a was different. statement. <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe that's why the relationship was different. Just she had to go through so much in the film. And, you know, there, it was actually very seldom that we'd even refer to it in terms of my life. I can think of two tough moments in the film and in shooting where... It was kind of like a, a tiebreaker, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know that it's terribly helpful because again, your memory isn't going to be a good movie. How, how did you deal with the tiebreaker situations? Well, if it's my life, I win, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Drake and Justin? What's that? What? Uh, 
I, I think it just works itself out. The honest answer will reveal itself. I mean, if you keep fighting, you try both ways. And then you right. see, and then you see what, what, and you both look at each other and go, "That was right. You're right, or I was right." It's like it totally. Re- it's so obvious, you know what I mean. But at right. the end of the day, sometimes you have to experiment and explore and try it both ways. But I'm, talking, I'm specifically interested in your relationships with with your lead actors. Oh, like, is it was it different? Um, I guess so. I mean, it's just so personal. The whole process. It's right. Like, that's what I mean. So no, not like, at all. Not, but all, is it every every moment is so magical? It's like <laughs> it's all about getting to that. You know, I mean, I, I'm calling any day you're on set making a movie <laughs> is a gift. It's incredible. So it's. Uh, that, that, that is a pat answer if ever there was one. No, it's true, man. <laughs> it's I, true. I agree that every day you're on set, it's a gift. But, there, but, but how are the relationships different when you're... Because, again, it's you. It is an alt-you that you're a story whose story you're telling. And know, you're looking, all the characters are you, in a way. So, I mean, they're all important and special. I'm, so. I'm getting nowhere here. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think every moment is, is honest to yourself. I, I mean, in a way, really. So. No, no, no. I, I, I'll give you that. I'm curious though about the actual interaction with the actor. Do, 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 maybe look, maybe the answer is it was literally no different in terms of my interactions with the other actors. No different. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's fair. Justin, would you say the same thing? No difference. You didn't have like yeah, a no. special kinship with. No. Well, I've, no. I mean, I was in a particular. It's probably a different situation because. Um, my lead, that character, much like me as a teenager, was super internalized. So a lot of it was voiceover and him saying nothing. You know, like my mom used to say, like, why do you answer people in your head? And I'd just be like... <laughs> and so... <laughs> um, that was a lot of my, my character. So um, <laughs> I made sure to find it, to find a kid who was still just a kid and, like... Um, yeah, I, I there's a lot of that, so it's probably a different experience. But um, but I do agree that I think every character uh, is probably a third yourself, a third someone you know, and a third your imagination. And each one just when you mix them all together, each one is colored and the color is salient here with more imagination. This one's maybe more someone your friend, but I think everyone in, ultimately has some part of you in there. That is an excellent segue to our first audience question uh, from someone who didn't provide their name, but how do you handle keeping a healthy relationship with people you base characters on if the person is not necessarily displayed in a positive light, hash, including family? Um, I think it's an interesting question. Like, how do you manage the fallout from portraying people who are, you know, real people in a way that they might not be super psyched about? Or in a way that, like, you actually may even consider positive, and they may say, "Yo, what was that?" Like, have you guys had that experience, sort of, after the movies, after people have seen the movies, and like, how do you manage that? Uh, yeah, but it's subjective. That's what's so great about art. Because I mean, every <laughs> your opinion of somebody's soul and their soul. I mean, it's all at the end of the day. You. That's why, like, you can't watch your movies after you make them. Once you're done with them, you let them go, and there's somebody else's. They're, you give them to the world, and they're not yours anymore. So anyone's opinion, good or day. bad, <laughs> anybody's opinion, good or bad, is their opinion, and it's sort of not attached to your process and your storytelling anymore. It's their experience with it. So I feel like you kind of have to detach yourself, or else you'll get you'll get stuck, and, and you'll you'll be so emotional. Anytime anyone says anything bad or good, you get high and low, and it's like. I mean, you got to let go of that. And that, that goes for people who genuinely think they're in the film, too. Right. Yeah. The rest of you? Andrew, I'm just going to ask a point blank. Like, what was it like with your parents? Yeah, you know, I mean, fortunately, the parents come off pretty well. They come off amazing. Yeah, but, you know, um, but I think, um, I think what it is is that when you're when you're writing these characters, when you're directing the actors to play these characters, it's this idea that you can't you, you're not supposed to judge. You know, like as soon as you judge a character, um, you know the the actor who's going to portray that character is is going to try and show that judgment as opposed to live that experience. And so, um, even if it's not like a positive point of view, my hope is that in it, you know in my film work that every character feels human. You know, and that, like, even if it's not a positive portrayal of someone, that they would be at least, like, flattered that you you didn't simplify them, you know? The other, the other thing that I'm very interested in, like, about that question is just, like, oh, like, 
you know, if this person is terrible, then why are you trying to, like, s establish a relationship or, like, keep a relationship with them, you know? Right, so but, if you portray someone badly, like, oh, well, they were Yeah, right I know, it's like they must have been real <laughs> bad to you. And, like, don't surround yourself with terrible people. Like, but, yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, so your answer would be, if people didn't like how they were portrayed, fuck them. Kind of. <laughs> uh, Justin and Elizabeth, I'm curious about you guys. Like, how do, you, how do you handle the aftermath of people being like, that was me, and I'm not super psyched about it? I don't know if anyone has been like that. I wasn't. Some of, a lot of my friends were like, yeah, we used to talk like that. I remember that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, cool, yeah. <laughs> who, who put me on this? No. Um, <laughs> Sorry, pass. I don't. Um, no, I think that's, it's, a, that's a good answer. Well, yeah. Well, actually, also, I even if they are conflicted characters, I, it wouldn't be a character if they're not conflicted, in my opinion. Like they should be flawed. Everyone's flawed. So I guess you know, it's more of a question of are they do do they find redemption? I don't know. Then I'd start getting into a heated debate with whoever had problems with their portrayal. If yeah, they should, or if they're really my friend. Anyway, never mind. Go ahead. Um, I was really worried about that, and I think I used this film as a venue to uh, be self-critical, and the lead character is the one that really is making the poor decisions and is in the hot seat. And so I did make that decision. This is uh, not about problems with anyone else. It's about problems with myself. Um, I worry about that going forward um, and other things I'm writing but where it maybe involves other friends that I think would care more. But I think that saying, you know, fictionalizing and making a movie goes a long way. If you care about someone, you're gonna protect certain things about them and use someone else as a stand-in or do it just enough that they're not gonna feel super revealed. I mean, it's a choice, but I think there's creative ways to protect people while still getting your point across. Sort of further to Andrew's point, if like anybody who you would actually present in a negative light, it's probably not someone you should care all that much if they're mad about it. Uh, so this question comes from Emily. Um, what was the process of creating a team who shared your vision of a story that obviously only you knew so well? So obviously film is a collaborative medium. You're reliant on scores, if not more people, to sort of carry off your vision. Does it does it differ any in putting the, the the team together than it might from a project that's not based on your own life? I mean, I I think for me, um, uh, you're looking for people who, um, I mean, in some ways, it, because it was a, a personal story, I, I was I was looking for for friends, you know, uh, I was looking for people who understood me and and could see that connection to the material so you know two of my producers um are film school friends of mine who i'd known for years you know before i even had the idea for spa night and then two of my producers i found um after through um the film independent directing lab um and 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 the reason why i felt really safe with them was because um they they could see that this story was close to me and, and they were just so deferential, you know? Um, like still doing the work as producers to um, question and, um, and heighten and figure out like what's the best way to tell this story. But um, they, were, they were respectful of my process and because they were respectful of that, I, I would give them more, um, I would trust them more to actually go further, you know? Um, so I, I think it was really nice to have people who were just good good people, good to me. Yeah, I kind of agree. I mean, all the people that have uh, worked on all my films are people I went to film school with, and if I, uh, that we met like 10, 12 years ago, so it's, uh, and we're really good friends, and we hang out outside of making movies, which is important. You know, we have a relationship. It's not, uh, you know, it means something. There's a lot at stake. So we really have to push each other to get the best out of each other. But it's, um, it's I mean, film school was r kind of ridiculous in a way. Wasted a lot of money on a lot of things, but I met a lot of good people that are in my life still, and I feel really lucky about that. So I think that's the most important thing that, that uh, came out of that. 
Yeah, I mean, I had similar. I was lucky enough to, to, to work with a creative team that I had worked with before, predominantly through that I met through film school. So we could all, they passed the, you could have a beer with them test and, you know, get in an argument and still be friends test. Um, you know, I did uh, work with a, a, the cinematographer. We hadn't worked together before, but uh, one thing that was important while I was making the rounds and, and dating you know, all these cinematographers uh, was uh, that he just got the, the story. Um, you know, he understood the character because he himself had, had had gone through, you know, th similar feelings of being an outsider, et cetera. And um, so it wasn't, it, it just it just helped add to if I I just knew that if I were, was ever at a bind on set and the moment came and I was like flustered and was like I don't know what shot we need that you know he could he knew the story as well so well that he could help be like you know what I think we should just get a close up and of this and and I could trust his his decision decisions as a storyteller as well. I took hiring my crew very seriously. The only person on my film that I'd worked with before was the producer, my husband, so I knew him quite well. But um, I was quite concerned that I would be hiring people, especially a cinematographer and an AD, who would give me the space as a first-time female director that I needed, um, uh, that would respect me. and. So I, I had really long interviews with people and I would always interview at least three people so I'd know um, the difference. And I'd share with them real concerns. After uh, meeting with my cinematographer the first time, I loved him. He was um, one of my idols, Michael Simmons. He'd made Rubin Brani's early films, uh, Man Push Card, Chop Shop. Thought he was incredible, but I got this feeling that he just wasn't gonna let me do my thing on set. He was gonna be in charge. So I hired a friend, and something tragic prevented my friend from working on the film. And I met with Simmons again. And he's like, uh, wow, I always get hired after someone dies. That's like my thing. And um, I'm like, well, I want to be honest. I love you, and I had so much fun drinking that bottle of wine and harassing the waitress with you. But I kind of got the feeling that like you were going to like you know, push me around on set because you're just like so loud and great, but like, I'm loud and great. I want to be, he's like, wait, wait, I'm so glad you told me this because actually this is me, the, this is the way I am when we're hanging out. Once we get on set, my job is to take care of your vision and to protect you, not to argue. Even if I think you're wrong, it is your film and I'm going to be there with you to figure that out. And so I was really glad I shared that fear with him because it actually meant that we started on a much better field. And so I'd recommend sharing these fears that feel like really embarrassing because then you're already making a connection. If someone doesn't respond well to that, then they're probably not gonna respond well to the high stress situations on set. But he ended up being a wonderful collaborator. But I, I went through you know a good hour over coffee with every head of every department until I found people that sure believed in the story, but even more important to me, were really great to work with because life's too short to work with assholes. Right. Preach. Um, so sort of look at this, this question of, of translating uh, sort of reality to screen a little bit differently. And this question comes from Chase. Uh, what do you do when you want to write a period or a subject piece that you believe there's an audience for, but you obviously did not live through? Um, how is it best to integrate your own personal experiences somewhere or not into a project that is not based on your life? Like how do you, instead of, you know, this is my story and now I'm going to fictionalize it. This is fiction. I'm going to incorporate these things for which I have some authentic emotional truth. How do you insert them? Or how do you approach that? I mean, the funny thing is, is as much as we're evolving, we still have the same problems. And the humans right. go through the same relationship issues and different things like that. So, I mean, and thinking about doing something like that, um, I think at the end of the day, they're all human beings that just look at things differently through a different lens. And I think just doing a lot of research is key. But at the end of the day, humans are humans, and they still have the same issues. And it's really about, OK, what's the story about? Is it a contemporary story that's through the lens of something that happened a long time ago? What, what, what is it exactly? And getting to the bottom of that. But at the end of the day, humans really haven't changed that much. We still have the same issues. Yeah, I think um, like if, it, if it's like a script or a story idea that's come your way that you're then going to take over and work on, um, one thing that I, I think is really valuable is is to write character bios for all the characters um 
and drawing stuff your, from your own life that like fills in kind of their backstory. And then you'll slowly start to see yourself populate um, those characters. Uh, it's a little bit like, like as an actor, like trying to find a substitution, you're just like, who is that person for me? Like, you know, and, and so realizing, well, that's, that's my mom. And then you realize, well, like, you know, what, uh, what was a memory of my mother that I, that I remember? And then having that be your character's memory. Um, it'll, I, I think that's really cool. So, uh, I think, um, kind of what Drake said was that like all the, all the characters are you. So, even if none of the characters are you in a script, you start to find ways to connect to them. And I think, I think writing bios, writing backstories can, can uh, help you get into there quicker. Yeah, I think that... You don't have to answer. I just... No. <laughs> no, if you, it, it, looked, it looked like you were going to. I, I don't want to feel like everybody I was, I, feels there like There was like a pause and it was like, should, are we moving? I don't know. No, I... <laughs> Um, I've done before kicks in my feature debut. I have did a lot of rewriting and polishing work, you know, as a screenwriter. And um, it's always weird to get material and characters that you didn't dream up with first. But I've definitely found a way, to, you know, to make it because life is too short that you have to find a way or a certain way in. And that way in is, is, is like loving every character and or finding something about them that you can love. And, you know, then you can always draw from there. And I totally agree that if it's, you know, took place 300 years ago, if it's a Game of Thrones or, you know, the OJ series, like that's still relevant today because they're all going through the same, same thing. Univer you know, it's a universal um, the human condition that you're exploring. So if that answered that, that question. At this point, I don't think I could make a good film that I didn't feel very passionate about. And right now, for the first time, I'm working with someone else's script. And I decided that I could tell this story because what it's about, there's really like only a few things, a few stories um, in this world, you know, of love, of sadness, of tragedy, whatever. And I just think you have to decide what it is that you're drawn to, what's the nugget of the story? What is it really about? What's the one sentence theme? And is that something that you feel? And if it is, stick, you could tell it about a paper cup. It doesn't matter, you know? Just like connecting emotionally something you've experienced. It could be a million years ago. It could be characters you've never met in real life. You just have to personally connect. And I think most of us could do that. So this is more of a uh, general screenwriting craft question. Um, but I have a story that I feel like needs to be told. And uh, I have zero training as a screenwriter. Where should I start? This question comes from Jay. Jay, I was. Time you got Jay. I was recently in that position. I knew I wanted to make White Girl. It's 2009, but I realized I didn't know how to write a script. I thought it would be easy. I tried. I was like, oh, I actually don't know. So on a whim, I applied to film school. I got in. I was older than most people there. Um, and but there were also a lot of people much older than me that were on their second or third careers. But I was maybe right in the middle. Um, and I said, okay, I'm going to go for two years. And when I get out, I'm going to have my script. And what do you know? Two years I got out. I had two scripts. And then I immediately made my film. So in my estimation, it would have taken me much longer than that to figure it out on my own. I'd been trying. It hadn't been working. So I know a lot of people have negative things to say about film school. A lot of friends in my life said, why would you go to film school? But you know what? It was the reason I got to make my film. It's the reason why I got to stop being an assistant to other filmmakers and got to start being a filmmaker. So if it's um, an online course or a night class, if you're not a person that can open a book and teach yourself or, or you need some kind of discipline, just enroll yourself in a fucking class and then they're gonna make you do it. And you're, you're, you're paying yourself to do it. You're like, I'm paying to make myself do this. I have to pay to make myself do it, so. It's the same reason I joined a gym. <laughs> so like, there's a, penal there's a penalty for not working out. Um, I, I would say uh, start with shorter format and work your way up and make stuff because it's one thing to have it work on the page and it's another thing to have it work on screen so you, you really kind of want to 
make stuff and make mistakes and give yourself the opportunity to fail and to grow and to continue to, to, to learn. So I, gosh, I mean, to write a feature screenplay, I would say make some shorts first and, and experience the, 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 even just the simple structure. Cause essentially a short film is a, is a first act essentially, you know, some people say, I mean, so it's like starting with the first act and going from there. Yeah. Kick same thing. 2009. I had it, this idea. I, I never thought I would be a screenwriter ever. Um, kicks with the kicks was the first script I've I've ever written. So um, there's hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's hope. <laughs> just stop. You act, no, actually, you just can't stop. Like it took me a year plus, you know. And I actually try to make that the, the idea for kicks into a short before I went to the feature. So then that helped a lot. But um, you just keep writing and writing and writing. Uh, and you eventually land on something. And don't be afraid to hit delete either. I learned that. <laughs> uh, on a similar note, uh, this question comes from Amanda. Um, your first time writing a screenplay, did you feel like you know what you were doing? Question mark. To clarify, a successful screenplay. Um, so I'm going to reinterpret the question slightly, which is to say, when you wrote your first screenplay, did you feel like you were doing a good job? And when you realized that maybe you weren't, how did you get past the trough of sorrow? Uh, I, I think this is the weird thing about screenplays, right? Is that they're not a final form, you know? Like, um, it, it's not like there's like the Pulitzer for the screenplay. There's um, the blacklist. But. There's the. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm um, but so for me, I think of I think of the screenplay like ultimately as like not even a blueprint because what you write isn't going to be exactly what you get, but kind of just like, um, uh, like a vision, you know? And so as soon as you start to, um, like not think of your screenplay as like a precious object, but as like a thing in flux, you know, um, then you can actually start to do work on it and not like, you know, have it, be painful. Um, so I, for me, I think it's really important to, to think of your screenplay as a living object that's going to change, you know, on set, you know, with the actors and the edit. Um, and, and so, you know, I wouldn't even necessarily say the script for Spa Night was a successful script, but it might have helped me get to a successful film. Uh, I think it's not great uh, to begin with, ever. I mean, the first draft is kind of the worst. It's like you just kind of got to vomit it out. So you got to give yourself that moment. Your first cut's always going to be a disaster. Your first draft's going to just the first thing, so it's okay. But I would say, like, when I get stuck, I bring in another writer and I work with somebody. Like, I don't work by myself, and it's awesome to bounce ideas off each other and call each other when it's not working and then take certain things. And so I, I think having a co-writer is a really valuable thing. And anything I've ever written was with somebody else. I, I don't really do it by myself just because it's so hard and, and, and you know. how do you approach that process was well I've been working with the same writer for 16 years we started making right, films yeah. in high school together <laughs> so yeah so their experience may not be represented. Your I mean, experience may so, not be represented. Yeah, I mean, oh, finding one, I don't, I mean, it's so so Just difficult. Find someone you've known for 16 years. I mean, it's like two heads uh, on, on one body, really. You you want you want one voice in there. So it's like people have the same emotional perspective on the same issue and then you can get there. Justin and how about you guys? Like, how do you, how do you confront a moment where you're like, why am I even doing this? And and, and push through. Yeah, I mean, you have like your it, it's a living thing thing because, <laughs> but for me, I, I'm not that. I don't think I'm that zen. I'm like, I'm like, as much as I tell myself, trust the process, just, Justin, just <laughs> trust the process. It's gonna come. You know, it's probably at least two times a week I have like a, a breakdown where I'm like, you're the worst, you're the worst, give up now, you're going to move back home with your mom like at any, any, any day. And I've accepted that that is my process. <laughs> I, I, I grant myself at least one day a week to just give up and, and be like, it's fine, I tried, I tried my best. <laughs> and then the sun rises, I'm like, all right, here we go again. <laughs> um, but that's just, I guess, accepting that. What I realized is that, um, you know, this is all subjective. It's all, you know, professional intuition in a way. And, and um, 
if you're not angry or you're not frustrated ever, then something's probably not right. Because usually when you care about something and you're passionate about it and you're striving for this unachievable perfection, you know, that's that's when you know you're onto something. And and if it's just like, I love writing, like I love it, I do it, I have no problem, I just write a script and then I move on to the next one. I don't know how good that material actually would be, like unless you're struggling with it. Or maybe that's just me because I'm yeah, like, I mean, generally, crying all the time. I, mean, I, I remember from my days as an executive, if someone ever called me and said, my, the script is amazing, you're going to love it, I'm like, I doubt it. Because <laughs> you, yeah. you want the writer who's like, listen, there's a lot more I want to do with it. I've, I've done a lot of work, but there's still eight different ways I know that I can improve it, so take a look at it and then let's talk. That, yeah. that inspires, at least in my experience, inspired a lot more confidence than just being like, yo, this is amazing. Yeah. Have a great night reading it. Okay, cool, good. I was overly focused on that the script should be perfect. And I think that's just because the production kept getting stalled. And I thought like, oh, this just has to be like as good as the movie, better than the movie. And now I've realized that I've gone through the entire process, that I continued writing as I shot the film, that I continued writing as I edited the film. And next time I will be easier on myself about the fluidity of the script. And I think that was really just something to keep me excited while I waited a year and two years for it actually to happen once I was ready. This is a sort of similar one, but it's, it's less about hating oneself and their, your work and more about when the well runs dry. And this is from, uh, I think it's Ken. Uh, how do you break past writer's block? Like when you have that moment of, I don't really know what else to say here. I don't know where this story goes, which may produce that moment of, what am I doing? I'm terrible at this. But like, how do you break through the, I, I guess it's sort of the fear of the blank page and, and the, the, the fear that the well has run dry. I, similar but slightly different question. Um, I go to like In and Out, or <laughs> like, but there's a, but for a reason. Like, I think in writing and, and anything like creative process, you're trying to make you know a thousand different decisions constantly. Like by the end of the day, you've made like a million choices. And if I hit a wall, I like to just go. And just be like, I want a number one or number two or number three. Like, I don't want to make another choice today. I just want, like, a burger because I forgot to eat for the last two days. Um, and, or, like, go, sometimes the most productive stuff I've ever done is just, like, walking around and, like, pretended to go buy stuff. Or, like, you know, like, going to a mall and, like, I would buy that. I don't know why. I don't know why, but it's one of those things where it's like easy choices and I f it like relaxes or whatever. Anything you do, whether it's yoga, meditation, or just take like a five hour shower. Um, I don't know. There's a drought, That's man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, yeah. there was a I drought. meant shower in terms of uh, it was more of a alternative. I think uh, leaving town is really important. Sometimes the change of venue is really key when you're writing or you're thinking of something, getting out of your, your mind space and going and living your life and taking a risk and going away for a few days and then returning, have a totally different perspective on everything. I, I think playing games is important. So, um, you know, sometimes it's about like switching up when you write, you know, like I, I had a film school teacher like once say like set an alarm for like four in the morning and then wake up and like you have to write for 20 minutes and then you can go back to sleep, you know. <laughs> and then like those 20, you know, it might be terrible, but it's, it's something. Um, I'm a big fan of going to the locations where your film is set, you know, like go there and just see what's around and you might notice a person do something that you're like, oh, that's great for my script. Um, and then when you're really, really stuck, like you literally feel like there's nothing left. Um, I, I feel like that's often your, your creativity saying time to get feedback. These are literally the best writer's block uh, suggestions I've ever heard. Like, no lie. Um, all right, this question comes from Monique. Uh, what is the hardest challenge in this business that you have overcome and how did you overcome it? Like what, was, what was the wall? What was the obstacle that you were like, this may be it? And how did you, how did you push through? My obstacle was just making the film and the challenges that kept coming up. I got pregnant. The funding fell through. Um, 
we realized more funding fell through at the last minute and in order to afford to make the film I'd have to cut 30 pages in one night to continue. Um, I lost locations, I lost actors, and there's just such a series of disappointments and disasters and emergencies leading up to the production that I think it's just a spirit of like, well, what film can I make? And what's the best version of this film I can make given these circumstances? And really, given modern resources, anyone here could, if you really wanted to, make a decent film on your cell phone. So no one could say they didn't have a reason to tell a story. So I think it's just most important to focus on what that story is and tell it any way you can, because once you've made your film, you're going to have more opportunities. We'll actually go down the line on this one. Justin, biggest obstacle? Um, uh, biggest obstacles, um, I'd say, you know, coming, coming, at, getting, getting kicks made as well. I mean, I came out of out of AFI with this short film that did really well, and I had the script ready to go, and I thought I was just gonna be like, cool, like I got signed. It felt like everything was working out perfectly. I no longer had to move back home to my mom's basement, and um, but then all of a sudden it was like, wait a minute, uh, you have a script with all teenagers no opportunity for celebrities and they're all people of color no one's gonna no one like everyone yeah, I good, would, job, good job putting that one together uh, yeah it was like <laughs> it was like this is a great script i walk into like 50 meetings and be like great script what do you want to do next it's like you just told me this was a great great script why this is what i want to do like i'm going to direct it and and uh so that was really Disheartening, I think, to realize that just that's just the, the state of the industry. Like literally, it was like, uh, you know, like you know, films with African Americans don't do well internationally. Right. What? For the record, that's a complete fiction with no data whatsoever to back it up. Yeah, but I've heard. That. I just make a point of saying that every time yeah. it comes up. But this is this, this is like know. shit yeah. that's actually said to me, uh, it's been said to me. I'm like, are you like what? And, and so here I am, like you know, it was like I'm not. But you never, you know, you just can't give up. And like it took a year plus and a hundred plus more meetings and then you know a similar thing happened where I met finally met the right people and and it took but it still took like 22 individual like financiers to put together this indie which if how many lunches I went on with and this is weird people you know from all over um, but <laughs> but that's but that's what it took and it took you know a long time but it finally hit that point and we also lost money we lost a location we didn't have locations we all that stuff happens but um uh you, you i guess also why you shouldn't freak out while you're writing your script because you're just going to be rewriting even in the edit so um anyway that was just getting kicks made was probably the the biggest kind of hurdle for me i mean yeah pretty much just what they said i mean it Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Expect for it to go wrong. Have a backup plan and meditate every day. I realized when I was making films earlier in my career, I was so stressed out. Every decision I made was so important. It was such a big deal. And now I meditate in the morning. I come to set and everything that goes wrong, we just take one decision at a time and make that decision and live with that decision. And it's like so much easier to make movies. It's it, Making movies now is more like a retreat. It's a place to go paint, to, to create, rather than a stressful environment that I'm not going to be able to solve. That's how it used to be. So I think changing your mindset is, is really important. But I mean, it's just everything. I mean, God, it's like actors fall out a week before locations money everything I mean it's just it's so hard it's not designed to work so it doesn't but what does work is the human spirit transcending the process and making something really beautiful and honest that's what's important and that's what you got to do um, I mean in some ways I feel like my my biggest obstacle is is ahead of me you know that um, I was able to make Spawnite because I just like made it on my own, you know, because it was a small enough story, um, and and you know we we got a lot of um, uh, you know a lot of bad feedback, and we got a lot of uh, we had a lot of obstacles placed around us. But then it was like, well, then we're just gonna 
we're just gonna sidestep it and and make the film that we want to make but i i think about like well uh, how do I make a career of this? You know, like how do I continue to tell the stories that I want to tell uh, at a bigger budget level? You know, but that are still personal, that can still push. You know, my hope to to show more queer people, more people of color on screen. You know, how how do how does that happen? And I can still pay my bills. You know, um, and that's a it's a tough question. And and so for me, like with with Spa Night, like. It's my hope that I can inspire other people to make their films, you know, that are personal to them, because then that'll just kind of diversify what Ameri the, like American independent film means, and and there'll be more room, you know, for what it can can be considered successful, um, and so kind of together like create um, a sustainable, diverse community, you know, and, and that's like. I'm thinking real big picture, like long term, um, but that's you know that's why like I I want to do panels like this so I can talk to you all and say like go make your movies. <laughs> and that is literally the perfect way to end this conversation. Let's give it up for these guys. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for watching. Have a great night. <laughs>